Before we came here, I was a little worried about the weather, so we checked the forecast for the coming days, and it showed that it was going to rain the whole time we'll be here, which sucks because we're going to walk a lot from one landmark to another, but when I woke up, I was surprised to see the sky was clear and sunny, and that made me really happy and made me want to get a nice hot breakfast. And I was thinking of a dish with eggs in it. So before we started exploring, we stopped by this fast food restaurant, which was right next to our hotel to have breakfast. This fast food chain is solely operated throughout Ireland. It's actually the largest Irish owned fast food chain. I guess it's like McDonald's, but it's only exclusive here in Ireland. Oh, and I also found out it's the only company here in Ireland that operates Papa John's Pizza as well. I just couldn't resist it when I saw this. The funny thing is that before I got this, I saw someone eating french fries with gravy, which I immediately wanted until I was told it's curry. I mean, gravy is already unusual, but curry? Anyway, we got this instead. It's garlic and cheese fries. Along with the fries, I got the breakfast roll. I wanted to try their burger, but like I said, I was thinking of something with an egg. Anyway, they call this a breakfast roll. This sandwich is a combination of crispy bacon, as they call it. To me, it looks like pan fried ham. And it also came with sausage and fried eggs. And it's all served in a soft French bread with what they call red sauce. That's probably their special sauce. For her, she got this. It's called Brekkie Mac. I think that's how you pronounce it, but it has the same thing as the breakfast roll. The only difference is the size and the bread. Even though I only got the ham and egg on that bite, this sandwich was really good. It was exactly what I was craving for for breakfast. I kind of wish though that I tried out their burger, because if this was good, I'm pretty sure the burgers here are better. But this sandwich was enough for me. And the garlic cheese fries, it was just too hard to stop eating it. It was really good. I've never tasted anything like that before. Anyway, if you're wondering, both sandwiches are about $4. And the large garlic cheese fries is about 5 So after we finished off the fries, we headed to our first landmark, which was just a block away from the restaurant. So, um, in the Abbey Theater, I thought it was going to be much nicer, but... It looks kind of old. Uh, we're not gonna go in there. Um, we're just gonna check it out. This is called the Abbey Theater or the National Theater of Ireland. It's one of Ireland's leading cultural institutions. This theater was opened in 1904, but the original building was destroyed by fire in 1951. The Abbey Theater was home to a lot of famous playwrights and actors throughout its existence. It was founded by Lady Gregory, Edward Martin, and William Butler Yeats who was a famous poet and one of the most important figures in literature of the 20th century. Today you can watch live performances from plays written by local playwrights. Moving on, we pass by this building. It's called the Custom House. It's located here on the north bank of the River Leafy. This building houses the Department of Housing, Planning, and Local Government. This building you see here was built in 1791, but a previous building was built in 1707. And I found out that during the Irish War of Independence in 1921, the Irish army burned it down to disrupt the British rule in Ireland. And in doing so, it destroyed a lot of historical records that can never be replaced. The Custom House. The Federal Building or something. This is nice though. Kind of black. The water's kind of black. It's really dirty. I don't know what this is. Do um, you know this river? This is the River Leafy, which flows through the center of Dublin. You know, I'm not sure why it's dark, but I found out that this river supplies most of Dublin's water supply and drinking water. I hope that's after they purify this water. So right here is called the Famine Memorial. This memorial is located just a few yards from the Custom House. I read that it represents the Great Famine in 1845 to 1848. If you didn't know, the Great Famine or the Irish Potato Famine was a period of mass starvation and death. It was estimated that 1 million people died, causing the population to fall 25%. The cause of the famine was due to a natural event called the potato blight, which is a microorganism causing the potato to decay rapidly. It actually infected a lot of potato crops throughout Europe and most significantly here in Ireland, making the Great Famine to be the greatest loss of life in the 19th century Europe. It also permanently changed the country's demographic, political, and cultural landscape. It's like made of bronze or something. It's like made of bronze, I think. 
It looks old. How old is this? This memorial was created in 1997, and the statues were sculpted by Roman Gillespie. So this is the Sean O'Casey, if I'm saying that right, bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge. And um, we're gonna walk down there um, because we're gonna go to a memorial, which is right here. This bridge is what you call a pedestrian swing bridge. If you didn't know what a swing bridge is, it's a moving bridge that swings horizontally to open a path for boats to pass by. Anyway, this was built in 2005 and is about 330 feet long. Like I said, we just needed to cross this bridge to see this landmark on the other side. We're gonna go to that boat too, right there. I have to be honest, I didn't even know what a swing bridge is at that time, but this bridge was really bouncy while people walk on it. You know, I think it would have been cool to see it in action. So this is the Lost Seaman Memorial. Um, I guess it's a memorial for seamen that got lost in the sea. I'm gonna get close to it. Actually, this memorial is dedicated to the people who lost their lives serving on Irish merchant ships during World War II. It's located here on City Quay, right in front of the Elizabeth O'Farrell Park. I read that an annual commemoration is held here every third Sunday of November. It's like an anchor, a big ass anchor. It's made of bronze probably. But it has a whole bunch of names and stuff. Right now, um, from here, we're gonna go over there. It's a boat. This boat is called the Jeannie Johnston. It's a replica of the ship originally built in Quebec, Canada in 1847. The original Jeannie Johnston was a cargo vessel that traded goods between the town of Tralee, Ireland and North America for many years. Anyway, the original ship carried 254 passengers, while this replica can only carry 40. This boat right here was built in 2002 and is used as a sailing training vessel at sea, event venues, as well as a museum. It's about like 10 euros to get in. And do you wanna go in? Or there's really not, nothing much to see, like, it's so small. I'll just probably use that money for food, probably. I think just standing here looking at this is good enough. So just a few feet from the ship, going east, is the Samuel Beckett Bridge. This bridge is a cable stayed bridge, meaning the bridge deck is supported by cables. It has 31 cables connecting a single forward arch and holds the road for vehicles as well as pedestrian lanes. This bridge is also capable of turning 90 degrees horizontally to allow ships to pass through. The design is taken from the national symbol of Ireland, which is the harp, and it was named after Samuel Beckett, who was an Irish writer. Oh, and if you're wondering, this bridge was opened in 2009 and cost about 60 million euros or 66 million dollars. So this is the um, Beckett Bridge. What is it called? Anthony Beckett Bridge? <laughs> no. Or it's the Samuel Beckett Bridge. That's what it's called, it's Samuel Beckett Bridge. And um, I was about to say that the, um, the sun is about to go up. It's about to go. I can see the clouds forming over here. But, um, it's really nice. Well, actually, it was supposed to rain today, right? That's the forecast, but we're kind of fortunate enough to get the sun today. It's really nice. And hopefully do throughout the whole day, so we're going to stay here. It's going to be sunny like this. But we're going to go to the bridge now. There's a pedestrian lane right here. And right here is like the where the cars are. It's not as a. It doesn't bounce like the other bridge. Because um, it's more sturdy. We're just gonna walk this and then walk back because we're actually gonna go that way. See that building? I don't know what that building is. But um, this bridge looks nice. Like I said, we're gonna go there. That's the convention center. I don't know what the convention center is or what it's for. But um, yeah, we're gonna head up that way. I don't think it's a museum, I'm not sure. 
The convention center of Dublin is exactly what it is, a convention center. I have no idea why I thought it could be a museum, but this was built in 2010 and its design became an iconic architectural innovation of the city, most notably the tilted glass windows and the curved walls. It's also the first carbon natural constructed convention in the world. Well, whatever that means. It's like a cylinder, huh? That's kind of like um, tilted a bit. It's like a tilted cylinder. I wonder if we can get go inside. You think we can go inside? We're gonna try to get inside. Okay, let's try to go this way. Wow, look at that. Oh my goodness. That's really awesome. Alright, so we got kicked out. Um, there's actually a private event happening right now. They, um, they told us to leave. <laughs> the guy was really nice though. So after getting kicked out of the convention center, we headed towards this area. This is the site of the 1974 Dublin and Monaghan bombings memorial. See, in 1974, three bombs exploded in Dublin, killing 33 civilians and injured 300. It's actually the deadliest attack in Ireland's history. Unfortunately, no one has ever been charged with the bombings, and the families of the victims to this day are still fighting to find out. Uh, there's a whole bunch of shopping areas right here. Um, it kind of looks kind of sketchy though, but... I'm just gonna walk around and check the sites and stuff. We didn't stay here that long, we just passed through it to get to this park. This is called Mount Joy Square Park. It's located here at Mount Joy Square. This square is one of five Georgian squares in Dublin. Over the years, the houses surrounding this park is home to many prominent and famous people such as politicians, lawyers, writers, and artists. It looks like a nice park, but I don't know, this area of Dublin, it's kind of uh, iffy. Maybe it's because of those ladies that we talked to. They, they said it's kind of dangerous in the sports, but we just came to come here in this park and then um, go to Croke Park. But now I'm having second thoughts about going to Croke Park. It's uh, We're going to have to walk all the way over there to go to Croke Park. So let's see if we're going to go or not. So we're just seeing a lot of like dogs and stuff here. It's almost like a dog park. But, I don't know, should we go to Croke Park? Let's see, if we walk down there, if it's kind of sketchy, let's just go back. But if not, let's go. Alright, we're gonna try and go to Croke Park. I'm not sure what it is, sure but sketchy. somehow this part of the city gave me this unsafe right feeling about it. I'd like to think it's because of those ladies we talked to earlier, telling us to be careful around these parts. But seeing shady guys hanging around street corners or yelling across the street doesn't help. This is it, Croke Park. Now, I don't know if we can go inside though, but um, we'll try. So this is Croke Park. It's a famous sporting stadium here in Dublin, which hosts multiple sporting events, but I know it more as a soccer or football stadium. The stadium can hold about 32,000 spectators, which makes it the third largest stadium in Europe. Let's see if we can go inside. Okay, so we got the brochure. We, wa we walked inside them. Um, we can't, um, we can't really go in for free. There's like a tour, which is about here, seven pounds for adult. Oh, the stadium to, tour is uh, 14 pounds, but uh, euros. So I don't know if, I don't know if there's a tour today, but um, anyway, maybe you wanna try and see, $14. Oh, here's a map. This is a map of the Croke Park. I don't know. Um, we'll just skip it for today because there's a few more places where we need to go today. So we're going to go to the next stop. We decided not to take a tour inside the stadium because it might take a few hours. I guess just being there was good enough for us. Plus, I'm not really comfortable in that area anyway. All right, so we're here at the Dublin's Riders Museum, which is, I think, this one right here. Kind of looks like a church, but it's not. Um, we're gonna go in here. We're not gonna go in there, but we're gonna go here. There's another landmark here somewhere. 
and there's like two landmarks here. Okay, first of all, this building I thought was the Dublin Writers Museum is really a church. It's called the Abbey Presbyterian Church, and right next to it is the museum. We didn't plan to go inside the museum, we just wanted to see it, and also the other landmarks I mentioned around this area. So this is the Dublin's Writers Museum. It showcases memorabilia from famous Irish writers and those who made an important contribution to Irish literature. So it actually is a museum. I don't know. I'll, I'll just stop by here. Um, it's, it's on my app. But we're not going to go inside. Okay. Right next to the museum is the Hugh Lane Gallery. Okay, so this is Dublin City um, Gallery. I think it's a museum. I don't know what I don't know what's inside it. Um, I have to look at my app. It's, uh... This gallery is founded by Hugh Lane, who was an Irish art dealer and collector in 1908. It mostly exhibits works from contemporary Irish artists, and it's the first known public gallery of modern art in the world. It says here it exhibits um, Hugh Lane's artworks. Yeah, I don't know who Hugh Lane is, but his works are modern art. Okay, so I didn't read that correctly. Like I said, Hugh Lane was an art dealer and collector, and the works from this gallery are from his collections. So um, we didn't go inside the Dublin Museum, or Dublin City uh, Gallery. It's uh, Hugh Lane's artworks and stuff. We didn't go inside, but right in front of the gallery is this, is the Garden of Remembrance. The Garden of Remembrance is, as you can see, is a memorial garden dedicated to all those who gave their lives in the cause of Irish freedom. It commemorates freedom fighters from various uprisings here in Ireland. This is actually the site where the Irish volunteers were founded, and it's where several leaders from the 1916 Easter Rising were held before they were taken to prison in Kilmainham Jail. This garden was opened by Eamon de Valera, who was the third president of Ireland in 1966. There's like a, there's a statue right there. So that statue is... Um... This statue is called Children of Lyr. It symbolizes rebirth and resurrection. It was added in 1971 and became the focal point of this garden. Well, that's aside from the water crucifixion feature you see here at the center. The design you see inside the water symbolizes broken weapons thrown in the river after a battle. It basically signifies the end of hostilities. It's raining. It's really raining. It started raining, so we ended up staying here a few minutes before we passed by this building. This is the Rotunda Hospital. It's a maternity hospital founded in 1745 by Bartholomew Mosey. He established this hospital because he was appalled at the conditions that pregnant women had to endure back then. And because of its continuous service to mothers and babies since its opening, it became the oldest operating maternity hospital in the world. Just around the corner from the hospital, we came across this hard-to-miss landmark. So I'm sitting here right in the middle of the street because uh, I need to film that. I kind of just like position myself like this. It's kind of hard to film it because it's so high. So this is called the Spire of Dublin or the Monument of Light. It's hard to miss because the stainless steel monument is 390 feet high. It was commissioned to redesign the O'Connell Street because of its decline and to replace the Nelson's Pillar that once stood in its place before it was destroyed by a bomb in 1966. The spire consists of eight hollow stainless steel cones stacked together, which features a base that has a design pattern of rock formation taken from the ground where the spire stands. Anyway, this monument was completed in 2003 and was greeted with complaints that the spire had little cultural connection to the city. And um, right in front of the spire is the um, general post office. It's the, actually the headquarters of the Irish post office. Or I guess the headquarters of Ireland, right? The post office of Ireland. It's that one. Like I said, this is the headquarters of the Irish post office. It was completed in 1818, making it the last Georgian public building in Dublin. It's one of the most famous buildings in Ireland because it served as the headquarters of the leaders during the Eastern Rising in 1916, and it has remained as a symbol of Irish nationalism. So from the general post office and right in front of the spire, we pass by the statue of James Joyce, going to the next place on our list. By the way, if you didn't know, James Joyce was a famous Irish novelist, poet, and teacher. So this church, um I forgot what it's called, but um, we're gonna go inside and check it out. So it's called St. Mary's Pro Cathedral. This is the St. Mary's Church. 
also known as the St. Mary's Pro Cathedral. I don't even want to try and explain what a Pro Cathedral is, because I'm really confused about what it is. All I know is that this church, even though it's not a full cathedral, became a symbol of the Irish national spirit after the penal laws ended. You have to really understand the history of Ireland to appreciate this church. I read little about the penal laws which prohibits Catholics from pretty much everything centuries ago. And then there is this Catholic emancipation that removed the penal laws and allowed Catholics to everything. You see, Ireland's history is very complex and very deep because it intertwines with British history. Anyway, going back to this church, let me just show you what's inside it. I believe this church was built in 1825 and the first thing that caught my attention is the apse which is the centerpiece right above the altar and below the dome. It's really quiet in here. I can't really talk loud. I'm just gonna go check it out. What is that? What is this? It's like a statue. This the, um, call this the altar. I read that there used to be a massive Victorian altar here before, until it was removed in the late 1970s. Behind the altar is the stained glass window of the Virgin Mary, and above it all is the apse. As you can see, it's decorated with reliefs, which probably signifies the assumption of Mary into heaven. That's the altar right there. Um, I don't think I can go up there, but I think I can go around here. I'm not really sure what they call this part of the church, but it has some kind of shrine where I'm assuming you can pray and meditate. Anyway, looking from behind the altar, you'll see this massive organ, which is the original by the way. It says it's one of the finest organs in Ireland from the late 19th century. After a quick tour of the church, we realized we haven't had lunch yet, so we headed back to Temple Bar and tried to find a place to eat. But as we were looking around, we passed by the famous Temple Bar pub we saw yesterday. And since we didn't get a drink here yesterday, we figured we might as well get one before we have lunch. I know I should get Guinness, but I really like this beer. Don't worry, we still have a few more days to drink Guinness. We're really not in a hurry. Sorry, my friend, you couldn't even have it. Sorry, bro. Yeah. I'm homeless, sir, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to eat a sense, get something to eat. Oh, oh I, I, we don't have cat. Yeah, don't. Right as I was taking my first sip, this guy asked me for some money. I'm not really sure if this guy was homeless or not, but when I travel, I don't carry a lot of cash with me. Anyway, we sat out here because we just wanted to have a quick drink, but with this guy bothering people for money and the noise of the construction right in front of us, we decided to go inside and check out the pub. As I mentioned from the previous video, this pub is probably the most famous pub in Dublin. It dates back to 1599 during the time when the Temple family established this area. This pub is known to have 450 bottles of rare whiskies collected from all over the world. It's actually quite big. It has this room, I guess if you just want to relax and enjoy a drink, you go here. And it also has this room. Now this room is a bit more lively because it's where you'll find a live band. We ended up sitting here for a while and listened to this band playing Irish songs. I had to remove the music because of copyright stuff, but they did play the John Denver song, Take Me Home Country Roads, which I said I heard that song played every night when I was here. So after we finished our beer, we came across Leo Burdock's. It's a popular shop serving fish and chips since 1913, and it's known to have been visited by famous celebrities since the 1990s. They actually have a good sized menu, but I wasn't able to film it. Anyway, instead of the regular fish and chips, we got this. This is smoked cod and chips. It was about $10 or so. We ended up getting this because it sounded interesting. Normally fish and chips is just fried cod, but this one is smoked and fried at the same time. I had the regular fish and chips before, but this will be my first time trying it smoked. So before I try the fish, I wanted to try the fries first. The fries are really good, it's seasoned just right, and most importantly, it's not stale or dry. I said that because the fish and chips we had in London was really dry. Now to try the fish. I noticed it had a nice crunch as I cut through it, and it's not oily at all. 
But since the fish was smoked, it looked really dry and I could smell the smokiness of the fish. Anyway, I decided to squeeze some lemon juice on this. The fish was definitely smoked. It had a really smoky flavor to it. I have to say, it was different. I mean, it was good, but I still prefer the original. It's a lot tastier and juicier. This one has a bit of a bitter taste to it. It's hot. It's smoked and um, grilled. I mean, fried. Smoked and fried is so different. But it's uh, vinegar. I forgot about my vinegar. The combination of the the smoked and the fried is kind of different. Some vinegar on it. Mm. Your vinegar is not that strong, huh? Even in London, put some vinegar, I mean, some salt on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can taste the vinegar. Mm -hmm. oh, it's really good. Mm -hmm. Man, this would be good with our beer. Mm -hmm. I know. Since we're done visiting places and landmarks today, after eating, we walked around Temple Bar just sightseeing, watching people, and looking for souvenirs to buy until we came across this church just south of Temple Bar. This is called the White Friar Street Carmelite Church. It had such a weird name, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing it all wrong. We decided to see what it looks like inside. So, this is the church. We're gonna go check it out. Yeah, not you. <laughs> Alright, let's try. Let's go inside. Let's see. Oh, it says no cell phone. I don't know if I can bring my camera in here. We'll see. This church was built in 1825, although a previous church was built here in 1539. The church contains relics of St. Albert, which was said to have been dipped into a well, and whoever uses the water will get healed. It also has the relics of St. Valentine, which was donated in the 19th century by Pope Gregory. We're in the, we're in the church and um, there's only, it's only us here. There's nobody here. And it looks like a really modern church. That they made, look, they made it look like it's old. <laughs> but I'm gonna go to the altar and check it out. I can only find little information about this church, but just by looking and physically being here, it felt like a modern church. It doesn't give you that feeling of being inside a very old building, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's uh, pretty modern. That's crazy. <clears throat> My voice echoes in here. But um, the pipe organs are pretty cool. You know, I realize that like I'm sitting right here. The pew the pews are really uncomfortable. It, um. Yeah, it's not comfortable at all. I was told that um, they designed that so that you won't fall asleep. Yeah, there's uh, really nothing much to see here. But um, we're going to go out again and just kind of walk around. And hopefully find them. I'm actually looking for a meat pie to eat for dinner. They don't, I've been asking around restaurants and stuff. They don't have meat pies. Um, which is funny. I think they should, but... I found one place that we might go to. They have like a Guinness pie. So we're gonna go there probably later tonight or we're just gonna check it out maybe if we don't find anything. We actually didn't look around for meat pies anymore because we've been walking all day and we're tired. So we just went straight to this restaurant that had this pie we wanted to try. And it's called the Beef and Guinness Pie. So this is the Beef and Guinness Pie. I was surprised to see it like this. I was expecting an actual pie where the contents are inside the crust. Anyway, according to the menu, it's beef, vegetables, mushrooms, all cooked in red wine and Guinness beer. And of course, it's topped with this pastry looking bread. 
Oh, and it also came with brown bread and some fries on the side. I was a little bit disappointed. I have no idea why they call this a pie. It's basically beef stew with bread on top. I was just hoping it tastes good. So for my first bite, I went for a piece of beef and mushroom. Okay, so the beef was really tender and the sauce was absolutely amazing. But this is not a pie at all. It's really beef stew. And after trying the crust or the pastry which tastes like a croissant, I don't think this stew needs it. It's just amazing by itself. After all, it came with fries and bread anyway. She actually thinks it's better than the stew I had yesterday. I think they're both equally good because the flavor is quite different. But this one I have to say is more balanced. The other one was just a little bit salty but the sauce was way thicker which I really liked. So I guess if the sauce on this is as thick as the other one, I would say I would agree with her this would have been better. So after polishing our food, this completes our first full day in Dublin. I remember being really tired, maybe I was still jet lagged. But as we walked through the streets of Temple Bar going back to our hotel, we talked about the things we'll be doing tomorrow. And as it turns out, it's going to be the most tiring day of this whole trip. We'll be taking a tour inside crypts with human remains, almost getting lost inside Phoenix Park in search of deers, tasting whiskey at the old Jameson's distillery and much more. But for now, we needed to go and get some rest.